Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 624 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 21st of May 2022 as I record this. On today's show I talk to Matt Bird about writing characters. How do we decide on the protagonist for our story, point of view, writing distinctive and believable characters and much more. So that's coming up in the interview section. In publishing and book marketing things, Draft the Digital released a guide to UBL's Universal Book Links. Now, these have been around for a while, but this is a really helpful guide. And I also thought it was a good reminder because UBLs are absolutely critical for wide authors because basically you can share one link and you can use a vanity link so you can have the name of your book in it if it's not been taken already. And the one link goes to all the wide stores in multiple formats. So you can use multiple ebook stores, multiple print and also print formats like paperback, hardback, large print and also audio and you can use uh, your direct links as well. You can even use affiliate codes for the different stores. So and with that one link, you can then use that on your website. You can also use it on social media, uh, emails. It's just much, much easier than trying to link to every store in every country. <laughs> so that is a new guide on UBLs. And you can set up UBLs for free. So universal book links at books to read. So books number two read com and you don't have to publish through draft a digital it's available to everyone for free so yeah check them out at books and link in the show notes to that guide also Orna ross and i did our advanced self-publishing salon we call it a salon <laughs> last week on author branding which is such an important topic and becoming increasingly so as more authors become interested in selling direct basically why will people buy from you, you have to figure out a way to build a brand basically. And your brand is your promise to the reader or listener. And it becomes associated with a feeling and an expected experience over time. And I hope that you come back to this show because of essentially the expectations and the feelings that you get when you listen to the show. I do work hard to try and make the experience a good one for you and a useful one. And in fact, we talk about how we've shifted our brands over time and how you like when you're starting out, you don't understand this stuff. And over time, you take steps and start shaping things. Of course, I split my brand into two in 2014, I think it was. So I published my first three novels under Joanna Penn. And then I realized that really my brand is quite different as JF Penn. So uh, we talk about different author names. We talk about how you can proactively shape and protect your brand because there's there've been some sort of classic social media issues where authors have sort of spectacularly said things that have torpedoed their brands and we do have to look after things. So yeah, all of that in our discussion, just search Ask Ally, A-L-L-I, on your podcast app and the advanced self-publishing show with me and Orna Ross is one of the episodes on the Ask Ally show. And that particular episode on branding is from um, May 20th, 2022. So in my personal update, how to write a novel is with my editor. Hooray! <laughs> it is just under 60,000 words, which is almost a perfect length for a non-fiction book, I think. It is... Really, I've tried to cut through the noise as much as possible. And I have literally read hundreds of craft books, hundreds, and I still read them and I will still continue to read them. But the problem is, like when I <laughs> when I looked at the number of books I had on story structure, both in print, on audio and on my Kindle, it was ridiculous. I mean, no wonder it gets complicated. If you try and read all the books on story structure and figure it out, especially if you're a discovery writer like me, I don't know how, why I ever thought these things that break down to the nth degree would be useful for me. But I have tried, like literally, I have 
have tried everything. But what's interesting with this book is I've really embraced the discovery writing side. So I go much more into that. So I think that will help it find a bit of a niche because there aren't too many books, I think, written by discovery writers on craft. And of course, the goal of the book is to help people write and finish a novel from idea to finished book, basically through the edit, writing and editing process. And so I've I just cut out all the extraneous stuff and I hope it's going to be really useful. My plan is now I'm not doing a Kickstarter. I talked about that previously, but I'm going to sell direct first, hopefully with ebook, audiobook and print, sell direct to hopefully you will buy direct from me first and before I put it on all the different stores. So that's going to be the first time I'm going to do that. I've always sold direct, but as a sort of extra option. But this time I'm going to try and push for direct sales first before I put it out everywhere else. So even though I'm not doing a Kickstarter, I'm still essentially trying to do that direct sales first. So it should be ready. I want to say early July early to mid-July probably because I've got to do the audiobook narration as well. Even though I did that episode on AI narration, I, as I said, I'm going to continue to do human narration as well. So that will be then. Now I'm focusing on my material for a full day workshop on the creator economy that I'm actually running also with Orna Ross here in Bath on the 12th of June 2022 as a part of that I am setting up my Shopify store. Uh, A couple of people asked me why I want to use Shopify and not carry on with Payhip. So I've been using Payhip, very happy with Payhip, but it's not, it doesn't have integration with print on demand. So I want to sell print direct, but I do not want to do print runs and shipping. I want to integrate with a print on demand service and Shopify has integrations with a number of different options. Um, I was looking at Lulu, but they don't have a five by eight size, which is my preferred paperback size and I have over 30 books that I want to put on there and of course I can't do that uh, if uh, well I just I'm not going to reformat all my books into I think theirs is a 5.25 by 8.5 or something like that I'm not going to reformat all my backlist so there is uh, another service that I'm looking at but essentially I'm it's there's absolutely you know I love Payhip there's also Gumroad there are lots of services that will do print options if you already have print in your house (laughs) or warehouse but you have to do the shipping whereas this is a print on demand integration with selling direct so I'm pretty excited about that but yes if you want to join us in Bath on the 12th of June we have a few tickets left uh, so you can always uh, link in the show notes or it's on Eventbrite you could search creator economy on Eventbrite and find the tickets and it is yeah we only have a few left and I'm I'm really looking forward, we're both looking forward to it actually, because we have a lot of material that we needed like a deadline to shape that material into a new presentation, a new workshop. And so there's a lot of things that I've been thinking about and talking about that I'm now going to shape into something far more coherent. So excited about that. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. Jay Thorne commented on the interview with Derek. I loved the conversation on the podcast. I only wish I'd been at that table with you both in Oxford. (laughs) Julie Schooler says, eek! (laughs) Author podcast with two of my favourite creatives on the planet, Joanna and Derek. We need more wow, not more writing civvers. Listen immediately, writing community. Thank you, Julie. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And uh, Terry Connellan said, love the chat with Derek Sivers, inspiring and practical and independence and connect- connection with readers in writing and sharing our creative work. Also, lots of you have already commented on the in-between episode, which only went out yesterday as I record this on the AI narration. Kevin McGill said, oh my goodness, that digital narration sounded amazing. <laughs> it is definitely better and improving all the time. Of course, there are concerns which I addressed in the episodes. So, uh, yeah, have a listen to that last show on the opportunities for AI narration, where I share samples at the end. Now, because (laughs) I've actually already scheduled next week's show before I recorded the extra show, so the numbers are out of order. (laughs) So when you hear me next week announce the same number as this week, yes, uh, (laughs) that's what happens when I just decide to do an impromptu show that I spent all day yesterday doing on that AI narration. But there we go. That is the fun of the creative process. 
You can tweet me at the Creative Pen. Send me pictures of where you're listening. I always love to see those. Or email me, Joanna at the Creative Pen dot com, or leave a comment on the blog and the show notes or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. And of course, even if I don't read out your various um uh, tweet or comment, then I still love to hear from you and I reply to I uh, hopefully most of them. So this episode is sponsored by Pro Writing Aid, which I've been using a lot this week as I finish the draft of How to Write a Novel. I use it at the end of the first draft before printing and also after my self-edits before sending to my editor. And I'll use it again before publishing. It is one of my absolute must use tools in my writing process now. And in fact, it is in How to Write a Novel in the chapter on writing and editing tools. <laughs> so why use software to help you? Why don't you just learn all the grammar rules and apply them yourself? Well, we all use tools to improve our process and we are also often blind to our writing issues. It helps to have another pair of eyes, even if the eyes are software. (laughs) Pro Writing Aid knows all the rules and helps you apply them. And of course, you can choose not to make the changes as you like. It doesn't get everything right, but it super helps. It can make your writing more active, help you find repeated words, words you could improve. It suggests other different words, uh, sentence, structure, grammar, punctuation, typo, spacing, lots more. I love it. It integrates with all the usual word processing tools. And importantly, for many of us, it integrates with Scrivener. That's how I use it. I open Pro Writing Aid on my computer. Then I open the Scrivener project within that and work through each chapter. I learn something every time and it has loads of reports to help improve your writing in multiple ways. Well, won't an editor do all this? If you're hiring an editor, why would you use software? Well, yes, an editor will do that, but I would rather pay my editor to fix the things that software can't. As brilliant as Pro Writing Aid is, it cannot read the manuscript as a whole. It is not a human. (laughs) And it cannot comment on bigger issues like how this character developed or inconsistencies or plot holes. So I use Pro Writing Aid as my essential editing tool before sending to my human editor. You can check out the free edition or get 25% off the premium edition by using my link, prowritingaid.com forward slash Joanna, J-O-A-N-N-A, prowritingaid.com forward slash Joanna. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my patrons and especially the limited series of Futurist episodes. These are all supported by patrons. Thank you for the last couple which I've had this month. Um... Yes, thank you so much. And thanks to new patrons, Sue McConnell, Kerry, Terence Pritchard and Best for Android. Thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for months and years. You are amazing. I really appreciate your support. And you'll get the extra Q&A monthly audio if you support the show. And if you do find the extra shows useful, then I really appreciate your support at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Matt Bird is an author, screenwriter, podcaster and blogger. His latest book is The Secrets of Character, writing a hero anyone will love. So welcome, Matt. Hi, thanks so much for having me on. Oh, no, I'm so excited to talk to you. But first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. Oh, I wrote a lot. I was an English major. I always liked writing. I always liked creative writing. I decided to become a filmmaker. I wrote and directed many, I would call them indie films, but what is below indie film? DIY, no money, changing hands in any way, shape or form movies. And then I decided to go ahead and go to film school. I went to Columbia Film School in New York and decided to focus very quickly, realized I was more of a screenwriter than a director, focused on screenwriting, got frustrated with the program in various ways. I talk about in my first book how it was basically a fantasy camp and you weren't allowed to criticize anybody for anything they had done. Well, not even criticize people, that sounds bad. But, you know, if you were to ever go, oh, you may have to reconceive this, then they would go, like, There's no, nobody should ever reconceive anything. You should achieve your prior <laughs> Very <vision."> artiste. <laughs> <laughs> and so I spent a fortune at Columbia and then it looked like I was going to make a big, when I got out, I got a big time manager and got a lot of Hollywood meetings and sold some screenplays, which they never paid me for. I made a little money, but I was very frustrated with Hollywood. Then I got cancer and lost like a year of my life to that. 
And then when I found that all of my career heat was totally gone by the time I came back from chemo and I was frustrated and I started a blog. And at first it was an underrated movies blog where we did, I just talked about, I watched a movie every day. This was in the heat of blogging back in 2010, I guess. you And I watched a movie every day and wrote about it. And then eventually that just became exhausting. I'm like, I got to come up with another way to blog every day. And I'm like, I could start doing writing advice to make it easier on myself. So I started giving writing advice and that took off and people really liked my writing advice. And so when they said, you should collect this in a book. And I wrote a book called Secrets of Story, Innovative Tools for Perfecting Your Fiction and Captivating Readers. I did not come up with the very wordy subtitle of that book, Writer's Digest did. And then that book has been very successful and I've been very gratified by that success. And then Writer's Digest was sold up by Penguin Random House. And Penguin Random House asked me to do a new one. So I've written a brand new book, The Secrets of Character, Writing a Hero Anyone Will Love. And I, meanwhile, I have a new big writing gig that I can't really talk about very much, but it involves a lot of the things that Joanna talks about on this show. It involves AI. I also have a podcast called The Secrets of the Story Podcast with James Kennedy. And I've got a second podcast, which is just for fun, which is called Marvel Reread Club with my brother, Steve. And we... And that's me. That's what I'm doing. Mm, wow. That is great. And of course, you, you've you gone through all the ups and downs there. I mean, talk about a hero's journey, which I'm sure we'll come back to. But you've had the, the excitement, the highs potentially of Hollywood, the downs of obviously the difficulties and cancer. I mean, that's a big one. It's so interesting to hear where you are now, which is obviously blending writing, technology, podcasting, blogging. So I love all that. And I think that's actually important as we come into the topic of the book, which is character. So let's get into the book. First of all, I want to address the the hero. How do we know who should be the hero of the story? So first of all, I should say that hero is gender neutral and morally neutral, that you can obviously, a hero can be a man or woman. I'm using that term uh, genderless, and it can be totally evil or totally good that a hero can be Uh, I'm not using that term to imply a hero should be a good person. Obviously, there are anti-heroes and all sorts of other heroes. But in terms of having a hero, so you had asked me in sort of your pre-questions, like, well, what if your book has lots of heroes? What if your book has, it's a multicast novel? And the bad news is that your reader, it's up to your reader to determine who your hero is. And your reader will usually pick one character to be their favorite. And sometimes it won't be the main character. (laughs) And sometimes your your audience will be like, well, you're telling me who the hero is, but I prefer this character. I prefer Han Solo to Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker is whiny. And it's and so you have to be prepared for that. You have to be prepared for the audience picking a hero. I talk about traffic where there was Michael Douglas as this struggling DEA secretary who has a daughter who's doing drugs. And people just saw that movie and they're like, we do not care about this guy. Boo hoo. And Benicio del Toro played a Mexican cop. And everyone is like, we like that guy. That guy gets the Oscar. Michael Douglas gets no Oscar. And it's up to the audience to determine who the hero is. Now, in turn, if you have a book that has truly a ton of heroes, so let's look at a book like War and Peace, which has many, many, many heroes. One thing that Tolstoy does in that book is before every scene, one hero gets a prep scene one person in that scene gets a little prep scene where they establish what their expectations for that scene is, and they become the hero of that scene. So you've got a huge sprawling novel. It's got maybe six main characters and 10 more fairly major characters, but every scene is one person's scene and has its own POV, and that is established beforehand. So even if you've got a ton of heroes, you're generally going to be writing about one PFV at a time. You're going to be writing about one hero at a time. You're going to be making people care about and privilege one hero at a time. Mm. Well, okay. So we should say POV is point of view. And yes. if people are new writers, that can be complicated. So I, I like the example of George R. R. Martin with the Game of Thrones book, because a lot of people might have also seen the, the TV series as well, because that to me is a classic multicast with a lot of different heroes. But in terms of the point of view, having read the books as well, he changes the deep point of view for the, a number of different characters. So in terms of a technical writing thing, can you explain how we use that deep point of view and almost 
I guess, manipulate the reader into understanding who the hero of the story is. I guess even number of pages uh, about that character from that character's point of view, I guess. Yeah, I've talked about how in Game of Thrones that you sort of have to skim ahead in Game of Thrones and see like, okay, the first chapter is from Bran's point of view. So is he actually the hero of the book? Is this a book about a seven-year-old boy? Because Bran is only seven in the books. And then you sort of flip ahead and you're like, well, every chapter, hopefully in that book, has the name of the POV character at the beginning of the chapter. So even, and I think there are seven POV characters and there's 22 chapters and you flip ahead and you're like, okay, who is Bran could be the main character? You're like, no, he's, he only gets like three of the 22 chapters and Eddard is clearly the main character. He gets most of the 22 chapters. And you sort of have to go, okay, maybe I'm not supposed to totally bond with Bran right away. And indeed, Bran is sort of, well, he is the sort of POV character through whom you're looking at his eyes and you're more interested in the world around him than you are interested in him. This is what is sometimes called a POV character, a character who we are meeting the world through his eyes, but he is not the main character. And we meet all these brothers through his eyes in the first chapter. We can sort of tell that we're choosing between them and it's easy to see that Theon is not going to be the hero because he can't take anything seriously and he slaps and kicks the severed head around and we don't like him. But we have a hard time deciding in that chapter. We sort of like John and I can't remember his name, the eldest son. And we're like, oh, they seem like two variations on manhood. They seem like two different versions of appealing manhood. And we can't quite decide. And indeed, the books can't quite decide until they abruptly decide at the end of the third book and or in the middle of the third book. And it's like, oh, OK, I guess the book is, has finally chosen its own hero. The book series has finally chosen its own hero when one of those two sons abruptly dies. Uh, sorry, spoilers. Try to avoid spoilers. But yeah, that's I mean, that's a really interesting book. But it's very important to Martin that every chapter only have one point of view. Martin eventually wrote some episodes of the TV show and then he did commentaries on the DVDs on those episodes of the TV show. And there's one scene with, again, I don't remember his name, the character who became the bodyguard to Tyrion later on. And they're preparing for the big siege of King's Landing. And there's a scene between two minor characters. And George R. R. Martin says in the commentary for that episode that he wrote the screenplay of that, oh, it's so much fun to get to write the scene because I wasn't allowed to write it in the books because neither of these characters were POV characters. Even though he had so many POV characters, he just knew he couldn't have that many. He couldn't have 20 POV characters. And so he was not allowed to write that scene because none of his POV characters was in it. And then on TV, it's less strict. POV is less strict on TV. And Mm. you can write a scene with two minor characters in it with none of your major POV characters in it. Mm, yes, because we're not inside their heads with TV and film, we're, whereas in, in the book, we're inside their heads. And this, I guess, uh, we can also use game the Game of Thrones books as a cautionary tale, <laughs> because as we record this, the books still aren't finished. But if you add more characters that you want to write deep point of view, the books become more and more sprawling, right? So I guess I would say a tip if you're starting out is maybe pick one hero, one point of view, and I think a really good example of this is is the Hunger Games. I always use that example in that if you just write Katniss Everdeen's story, it can become a lot simpler if you just like, here's the hero and here's the arc and there you go. There are other characters, but if you have one, it becomes much easier. So is that a way to simplify um, a story, I guess? Oh, yeah. I mean, that would have been a completely different novel if we'd had just a Hamish Pita scene without Katniss there, or if we had, you know, broken her POV with her at all. It's such a strong voice in that novel. And voice is, of course, one of the most important elements of writing, especially of novel writing. And to have her strong voice in every paragraph, in every line of dialogue, well, not every line of dialogue, not when she's talking to somebody else, but to have her strong voice in every line of that book is you know, what makes that book work. That book is so much driven by voice. And even though the book is in third person, I believe, right? Mm, I think so. Yeah. But even books in third person, if they have limited POV and that book has limited POV, we are only seeing things described in third person that... But is it third person? I don't know. Yeah, well, the, and this, but this is interesting because we can't remember off the top of our heads. And but we both feel 
that we know that character and we know that character voice in such a way that it, I guess it, it doesn't matter so much, like a deep third person, a close third person, whatever they call it, point of view, brings that character to life so much more than a much wider point of view, I guess. Yes. No. Okay. It is first person. I just looked it up. My book begins with the Hunger Games as the main example, and I'm quoting from the book. So it wasn't hard for me to look up here and see examples of whether or not it's in first person or third person. But yes, I think that the Hunger Games is it's not the greatest novel. It's not the it's not an all time classic of literature, but it is such a good example of how to become a successful novelist. It is such a successful book. It, it is such a good book to study in terms of how to write, how to learn to be a writer. And it because it is so simple, because it is so powerful, I guess in some ways cynical. You know, this was a writer who was writing a lot of books about cockroaches talking to each other under the streets of New York. And then she said, I'm tired of writing about cockroaches. I want to write a more successful book. And I think she made certain somewhat cynical decisions when she wrote that book. And she and they were brilliant decisions. <laughs> and in terms of craft, it is unbeatable. Mm, absolutely. Right. So let's get getting back to characters. How can we make readers believe in the reality of our characters, make them three dimensional? I mean, obviously, we can't do that for every single character. It's just not necessary in a book. But in terms of our main characters, how do we make them believable, but obviously still special enough for a story? So in my book, I talk about how you have to do three things right away. You may have to make the reader Believe in the reality of your character. You have to make the reader care about the circumstances of your character. And you have to make your reader invest in, make the reader invest their hopes in this character to solve this problem. Most stories are about the solving of a large problem, and we need to invest our hopes in that character to solve that problem. So I cite, I begin the book by talking about the Hunger Games because it does all three right away brilliantly. So one of the first ways, as I've said, to get us to believe in a character is voice. If a character has a believable voice, then we love him right away. And one of the main ways to determine your voice is how many periods versus how many commas you use. And there's a lot of periods in the Hunger Games. Let's just look at the first paragraph of the Hunger Games, or not the first paragraph, it's like the third paragraph. And I think it's it's a great example of believe, care, and invest, but it's also... A good example of how my advice is sort of the opposite of save the cat because she decides to, she almost kills a cat in the first paragraph and then she does kill a cat two pages later. And so in the second paragraph, it says, sitting at Prim's knee, guarding her is the world's ugliest cat, mashed in nose, half of one ear missing, eyes the color of rotting squash. Prim named him Buttercup, insisting that his muddy yellow coat matched the bright flower. He hates me, period, or at least his trust me, period. So, and then she talks about how she tried to drown him. <laughs> and, and so right away, she's got a very believable voice. She's got very unique circumstances in her world. And we care for her right away because she couldn't afford to have a cat. She felt like she had to kill the cat in order to protect their meager way of life. And boy, oh boy, do we invest in Candace right away because she is out there bow hunting. <laughs> and what could be more badass than bow hunting? And she does kill a lynx that uh, another cat, a big cat has been following her around and she has decided to kill it because it is chasing off game. And then she sells its pelt. <laughs> and obviously killing animals is very tricky in books. A lot of people are very upset by it, but in this case, I don't think many people are very upset by it. I don't think many people are like, Oh, that poor lynx. I think people think it's pretty awesome when they read that in the hunger games. But so there you go. You've got believe Karen and best right away on the first page. Yeah. And it's interesting because, of course, we say about the reality of the character. Is it a believable character? But we're writing fiction. Does it have to be a, a believable character or just someone, as you say, that we care and invest in regardless of, I mean, I've I've not been in a situation like that where I've been starving so much that I have to go hunting with a bow and arrow. Most of us haven't, thankfully, but we still believe it, even though that's not our situation, right? So is it that it has to be believable or just care for in some way? Well, I think that believability has nothing to do with, you know, oh, this is Superman, he's flying, heroes can't fly, therefore this isn't a believable character. Believable is more about having a character, you know, Superman 
can fly, but also Superman has to have a job. And he's someone who has friends. In the comics, he has friends. In the movies, like Man of Steel, he does not have friends. He has a love interest, but Jimmy Olsen did appear in one of the Snyder Superman movies just to get killed in two seconds after he appeared. He He's not Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. You know, you need to give your hero a fully fleshed out world. You need to have sensory information. There's plenty of sensory information in the Hunger Games. Sensory information makes the world come to life. Anthropomorphizing nature makes the world come to life. They eat a ton in the Hunger Games. Descriptions of food. Audiences love descriptions of food. They have their own unique jargon. They've got just a bizarrely complicated setup. I think a lot of times people are told, oh, don't have a complicated setup in your book. But the whole math of the lottery in the Hunger Games is very complex. And I think audiences actually have, I think that makes worlds more believable when there's a lot of rules that have to be explained, even though we're told often don't do that. I think that there's all sorts of ways in which the Hunger Games is believable, even though we may think that America will never fall and no one will ever start running a Hunger Games. That has nothing to do with it. One of the things I just rewatched this weekend, the movie Captain Marvel, and at one point, Captain Marvel is talking to Nick Fury, and she's like, prove to me you're not a scroll." And so this is exactly what writers do. We have to have our characters prove to readers that they're not scrolls. And Nick Fury is like, well, let me tell you about my history. Let me tell you about my mom. Let me tell you some interesting biographical details that make me a unique, interesting person. And then she says, name me one more thing that you couldn't possibly have made up about yourself. And that's so much about believability is including details that make the reader go, the writer couldn't possibly have made that up. That's too real. And then Nick Fury says to her, if, co- if Nick Fury says to her, if toast is cut diagonally, I can't eat it. And then he then realizes that she didn't actually need him to say that, that she was already convinced, but she is at this point sort of cracking up because she got him to admit that. But in fact, she did need him to say it because that is the ultimate way to prove that you're not a squirrel to prove that your characters are not squirrel are not imitations of life, imitations of reality to prove that they're real characters is a detail. Like if toast is cut diagonally, I can't eat it is gold for a writer. It, that mm. is the sort of thing where you can pull it from your own life. And then that's the sort of thing where you can pull it from your own life and gift it to your characters. And then they come to life, but the audience can tell, Oh, that's not made up. That must be from somebody's real life. That must be from the author's real life or the author's mother's real life or something. You know, think about it in Sopranos <clears throat> where Tony Soprano's mom won't after the Tony Soprano's mom won't answer the phone after dark. And you're like, oh, that has to be real. And indeed, that was true. In the DVD commentary, David Chase talks about how his own mother would not answer the phone after dark. And he's like, she's like, somebody called me after dark. And he's like, well, who was it? And she's like, I don't know. I didn't answer the phone. It was after dark. And he's like, mom, that doesn't make any sense. But of course, these days, nobody answers their phone. <laughs> yeah, I never answer my phone. <laughs> yes. Okay. So you've talked there about interesting details, which I totally agree are really important ab- about people's lives, about backstories. But one of the things that can be overdone are these, I guess, what are called character tags, which might be a scar or a limp or something like that distinguishes them physically. But how do we write these sort of character descriptions? How do we distinguish our characters, but without making them gimmicky or cliche? Well, it's funny. So I'm rewatching the Marvel movies right now, and you can tell that we're on movie number 20. We're on movie number 20. We just did Captain Marvel. And it's so many characters have eye patches in these movies. <laughs> it's like <laughs> Nick Fury has an eye patch. Odin has an eye patch. Thor eventually has an eye patch. And so you've got to, like, eye patches are done. You cannot do eye patches anymore. But obviously, Harry Potter made it work because they gave him a lightning shaped scar, which is like, oh, okay, this sort of, you know, Lots of characters have scars. James Bond has a scar in the books, but not in the movies. But, oh, okay, lightning-shaped scar makes it come to life again. Or characters may have tattoos, but the tattoos in Avatar The Last Airbender are so distinctive and cool. And they are really great. Like, Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean has a P branded on his arm by the East India Company. Scars and tattoos and disabilities are they do make characters come to life. You're actually marking your character. You're actually giving your character a physical distinction instead of just character distinctions, instead of just more ephemeral distinctions. But you're right, they can totally be overdone and it's a risk. And certainly 
a character cannot have them and still be a fully fleshed out playable character. Katniss Everdeen does not have a scar, a tattoo, or a limp. I tipped, I think probably her tag is the bow and arrow. Yes. Because that is is both the thing that provides food, it becomes her weapon. I mean, yes, in my mind, that's what springs to mind. Of course, in the end, it's that the bird and that, I guess, some other actions. There are things when you think of the character, I guess you could say there are associations with that character that become part of who that character is. And as you say, a scar, I mean, <laughs> I think when you're a new writer, scars are almost the one that happened. I mean, everyone has some kind of scar and the scar also implies backstory, which can also help with character and plot. And certainly that's what it does in Harry Potter, I guess. Any any tips for coming up with some of these details? I mean, you've said mine your own life, but I mean, I'm on novel number, what, 18 or something? <laughs> Like I, I definitely find original character tags to be uh, difficult to to find, but as you say, maybe Marvels were using them. Uh, maybe that's the way for. And I haven't used an eye patch. <laughs> there you go. You know, keep a journal is the number one thing to do every day when you get home. Uh, before you go to bed at night, write what do you down. Mean when you get home, we're all at home. <laughs> we're all at home all day long. It's true. I work from home, but when if you have any way to get out in the world. And anyway, to see or hear anything, or just with your own family at home, then write down interesting things that people did or said. And write down stuff where it's like, you just have to be constantly on the lookout for details. Like if bread is cut diagonally, I can't eat it. And you may be on your 18th book, but I'll bet you there's more than 18 things in your life. Like if bread is cut diagonally, I can't eat it. And you just need one per book. So I think <laughs> you just have to keep you have to keep mining your life and coming up with more things like that. I give examples in the end of my book about examples from my own life of believe in Karen and Fest. And the I and in order to come up with those examples, I just checked my own sheet where I keep track of details from my life. And the believe detail was actually my daughter singing a song from the latest rap musical she had written. My daughter loves Hamilton and writes rap musicals. And I just quote the absolutely buck nuts, insane lyrics from her rap musical songs that this 10 year old girl was writing. And I'm like, that can't be made up. Like that is something that is, and it's also something that's very real. And we have not really seen this Hamilton generation yet. This generation of 10 year old girls who have memorized Hamilton on screen yet, or in, I don't know if it's showing up in novels yet, but it's sort of thing where anyone who knows 10 year old girls knows this is true and hasn't seen it on screen yet. Hasn't already, this hasn't been done to death yet. And I'm like, that's a perfect believe detail. Mm, interesting. And this is something that people struggle with a lot, particularly at this point in history, when there's a lot of focus, rightly so, on diverse voices. Very important that we have diverse voices writing books. But as writers, we also want to write diverse characters. And uh, I don't want to just write middle-aged, married, <laughs> white British characters. And in fact, I don't. <laughs> In fact, I, I rarely write them at all. Um, but how can we write effective characters from other cultures, other races, other experiences in a way that is still respectful, I guess? It is one of the hardest things. It is definitely one of the hardest parts of writing. A lot of it is just research. Watch documentaries, transcribe voices of interesting characters, and try to really get these voices down. And obviously, the best thing to do is just get to know a wide variety of people and write in the voices of people you know or have gotten to know through transcribing their dialogue from other places, from reality shows, from documentaries, from anything you can. But it's one of the hardest things to do. Mm, yeah, I think research is the key. When I write multinational novels with people from all different cultures, and what I do is, as you say, I research. So, for example, I wrote a, a scene set in an Appalachian snake handling church in the USA. I am never going to go to one of those churches, although it'd be really cool, uh, where they have serpents and that's part of their worship of, of God. And I found this hour and a half documentary on YouTube. And as you say, I literally transcribed it because the way they spoke during their service was just so something I could never make up 
And so by transcribing it and then mentioning that documentary in my author's note, I hope that I was able to respectfully talk about that culture in the process of writing my fiction, plus also set up my character within that church that explained their later behavior. So that's a sort of cultural and religious difference. And I, I did the same with Destroyer of Worlds, which is entirely, almost entirely set in India. So I think research is a great way. And as you say, it's often documentaries or memoirs or or books you know written by particular people and I don't think we should be afraid of it I think it's really no. it's too important to be afraid it's, of we oh just it's have absolutely to necessary embrace it. Mm. and I mean if you look at one of the most beloved tv shows of all time The Wire has a lot of diverse characters in it and it was written mostly by white people like the creator of that show David Simon was a white person and yet he never got in trouble for that show people were like people absolutely loved these characters people you know Idris Elba became a star Michael Jordan became a star And I went ahead and I looked at that show. Like I said, it's dangerous to look at other fiction examples because you're getting a, you know, you're getting a second generation voice. But when I went ahead and transcribed some dialogue from that show, I realized that, yeah, I talk in my, both my books about metaphor families. And I realized that everybody on that show has a different metaphor family. They have different well of language that they go to. And I'd remember just everybody cursing up a storm on that show, but like Omar never once utters a curse word in any way, shape, or form on that show. And his his metaphor family was pirate. <laughs> and I was and which is not a metaphor family you would instantly associate with because metaphor family sometimes comes from a character's background, but sometimes comes from their aspirations. So he was talking about we've got a parlay and these words that you sort of associate with Pirates of the Caribbean. I talk about in my first book, how in the UK version of The Office, how Gareth's metaphor family was military, even though he works at a paper company. And he, like Omar, had sort of wanted to be something other than what he was. <laughs> he saw himself in a tradition of people that was did not match his immediate surroundings. And that's such a great way to get a character to come alive, such a great way to get a character to be believable, is have them have one source of language that they are drawing from that might be atypical. If you look at Star Wars, Obi-Wan's metaphor family is military as well. He uh, he is this spiritual hermit, but he uses all of this language out of the military when he talks. And it really gives the character a strong, ironic counterpoint and baked into his character and really makes him come to life. Yeah, and I... I... I wanted to just, uh, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to talk about the subtitle, which mentions, the subtitle is Writing a Hero Anyone Will Love. And I've been watching a couple of things recently. So We Crashed on Apple TV, which is just brilliant. And you just hate the characters, but they're so compelling to watch. And then also Succession about the billionaire media mogul and the family. There are literally no likable characters in both of these TV series. And yet I cannot look away. And so what do we need (laughs) Do we always need to love characters or so, or what are you using that word for? In preparation for this podcast, because you had said you wanted to talk about We Crash, I went ahead and watched the first three episodes of We Crash. And then I rewatched the first 10 minutes because that's what I'm talking about in my book is the first 10 pages of a book or the first 10 minutes of a movie or TV show. And how can you see how, because almost always they got us to believe Karen and Fest in the first 10 minutes before there's any plot. There's no plot in The first, you know, WeWork is not founded in the first 10 minutes of We Crashed, but we totally believe Karen invests in the first 10 pages and has nothing to do with being a quote unquote lovable character or a likable character. They're not lovable. They're not likable. Well, I say that they are lovable. They're not likable, but they are lovable. And they, you know, but they're lovable in a very certain way. So let's talk about how we believe in the first 10 minutes of We Crash. One of the things that really makes character believable. It's when they have mottos. And you find this, especially on TV, TV characters have a lot of mottos. I go through my book, like the three different mottos that House has and his pilot and the three different mottos that Grissom has in CSI. And Adam in We Crashed gets a lot of mottos right away. Fear is a choice. You're a supernova. These are mottos. I talk about how he's got very distinctive tastes, Everybody loves songs. They love characters who love songs. And he loves the song so much, he makes his assistants desperately run out ahead of him and pump the song into the WeWork speakers before he enters the office. 
he has distinctive tactics, and this is something that makes us believe and infest. The way he steals his neighbor's Chinese food in the first 10 minutes is so distinctive, is, is so makes his character come to life for us, and so makes us invest in his character. You know, we are investing in him to solve the problem of his life. The problem in his life is that he's poor, is that he's not rich. And we need to invest in him to solve that problem, even if we don't really want him to be rich, even if we don't want there to be more billionaires in the world, then we see that that is his problem in this show and we want him to solve this problem. We always, in fiction, if we see someone is trying to tackle a big problem, we're going to root for them to solve that problem. And the the trade craft involved, <laughs> to use the term from spy movies, in how he offers his neighbor a beer, which doesn't exist, and really just as part of this clever plan to steal his neighbor's Chinese food, is so wonderful and so makes it come to life. And in terms of caring, they do a very classic trick in We Worked. They jump ahead to the worst thing that happens to him. And they have a flash forward and then they jump back to the past. And so often the flash forward is the hero getting a humiliation that is deserved but outsized. And we can tell in the flash forward, he gets fired from his company. We're not sure that's what's happening, but we're pretty sure. And we can see he deserves it because we see him wake up halfway through the day and have a servant rush in with a bong for him to smoke before he actually gets out of bed, before his feet touch the floor. So obviously that's a bad CEO. He should be fired. We see him then, this, another big reason to believe is distinctive wardrobe. We see him come to work with no shoes. We see him walking the streets of New York and coming into his office with no shoes on. It's like, okay, that's something where you see that. It's like, that has to be from real life. And indeed it is from real life. And, but then, so that's another reason for him to be fired. But we also find out that he has borrowed $380 million against the shares of the IPO they're about to do that is now going to be canceled. And we would we love to see somebody, you know, we understand that someone should get fired for smoking from a bong during the day or wearing no shoes to work, but like losing, having it cost them $380 million, like that seems like an outsized humiliation. That seems like a massive humiliation for Toking up at work, which is something that, or toking up when they're supposed to be at work, which is something that a lot of people haven't done and haven't been punished to that degree. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, all these uh, tips and the book. The book is well structured in terms of tips. I appreciate the the way you've written the the book, which is basically a succession of tips and examples for each. So I definitely recommend the book, The Secrets of Character. So tell people where they can find you and your books and your podcast online. As of today, you can go to Amazon or your favorite independent bookstore's website or even your favorite independent bookstore in person and buy a copy of The Secrets of Character Writing a Hero Anyone Will Love. You can also get my previous book, The Secrets of Story, at any of your favorite bookstores. You can find my podcasts on Apple Podcasts, um, The Secrets of Story Podcast, or Marvel Reread Club. You can go to my blog, thesecretsofstory.com, or just secretsofstory.com. I think I actually also own thesecretsofstory.com, but I never actually do that, uh, where I've been blogging since January 1st, 2010, and I have a massive amount of content that you can enjoy, and I'm redesigning the blog. It'll relaunch soon, redesigned, but uh, the original blogger version is still going strong, and you can also see about 150. I've moved to the top of the sidebar 150 examples of novels, TV, memoirs, and movies where I break down, believe, care, and invest. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Matt. That was great. That was great. Thank you so much for having me on. So I hope you found the interview with Matt interesting and that it gave you some ideas around character if you're writing fiction. Next week, it's back to business when I'll be talking about reader magnets and email marketing with Tammy Labreck. In the meantime, happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.